I came um, about um, a year and a bit ago for World Youth Day. So I was here for five weeks then. And uh, I was very blessed, I really enjoyed it. I had a great time. I found that um, the people were very friendly and very caring and just had a very blessed time. When I did one of the talks, it's probably the biggest talk I ever gave. I think I was speaking to about one and a half, sorry, about 170 odd thousand. Um, the first talk, which was at um, Darling Harbour. And as I was walking up, I said to Jesus, is this what you created me for? And I felt him say to me, the only thing I created you for was for me to love you. And I, I, I found it quite hard doing the talk because I was crying so much. But um, it was just the real blessing for me. And then the next day I spoke at um, the race course and uh, I think there was about 400,000 young people there. And again, it's such a privilege to be able to speak in the same audience as the Pope and to such a, you know, an incredible um, group of young people. So World Youth Day was fantastic and I really loved Sydney and loved the Australian people. I wrote my um, book um, From Gangland to Promised Land which has become a bestseller and I think when you write a book you have to get very deep you know and so when I was the person I used to be it's almost like you have to get back into that person and I can say to you with all honesty I didn't even know who that person was you know I've come so far away from what I was as a gangster that I don't even recognize his motives I don't recognize anything about him because I think it was a um, it was a an illusion the real person I was always called to be is the person I've become but I just didn't know who that person was so it's quite weird when you look back at so many years of your life maybe from see I was very wounded as a child and um, I think a lot of those wounds um, made my, my choices more limited. I don't for in any way say that, the, that my choices weren't my choices, but I think when you've been very wounded and very hurt, your choices become more limited. You know, I had a girl who was in community with us who was very sexually, badly sexually abused, and I think that she was very promiscuous. Now, even though she chose to be promiscuous, her choices were much more limited than someone who had come from a very balanced, good family. And I think with me, I came from a lot of violence, a lot of abuse in that area, also a lot of low self-esteem. And I think so my anger that was in me, um, it limited my choices when it came to violence, like it limited her choices when it comes to being promiscuous, if that makes any sense. It was almost like she judged herself. And when she was in community, even though she had found that freedom in God, she had found that freedom in Christ, there was a part of her that never really had that freedom that I felt Christ was really calling her to. And I remember asking her to pray for the root cause of where that pain maybe came from, because normally it's not the abuse. And, and there was a, a beautiful incident where she came to me after a few months and she just said to me, John, um, I believe the incident where a root cause of my pain was, was when I went with 10 boys from my school round to this church and I let them do whatever they liked to me sexually. Three days later, it was my 16th birthday and I tried to kill myself. <clears throat> so I said to her, well, I want you to go back into that situation and I want it to be real, you know? And um, she told me that she was in the situation and it was very real. And I said, now I'm going to invite Jesus into that situation. So I just prayed for Jesus to take, you know, to really take command over that situation. So that when Lily looked back, she just know that Jesus has healed that situation. And um, Lily, as I was praying, she just threw herself on the floor and she was crying and crying and crying. And I left her, she was, you know, 20 minutes. And then when she came round, I said, what happened? And she said, Jesus appeared in amongst all this filth and he had a white gown and he was wrapping it round me and he kept on saying, my innocent seven-year-old little girl, my innocent seven-year-old little girl. He didn't see what Lily was doing. All he saw was his wounded little child who was so hurt. 
And I think when we look at ourselves, even though we might have done atrocious things, when we look at ourselves through God's eyes, we always have that compassion. We always have that mercy at the forefront of our heart. The same as we look at other people through God's eyes. To me, he always looks at us not as the monsters, but as the children who have been hurt that's caused us to be or do these monstrous acts. Like, I, as I said with my book, my mum wouldn't read the first half of the book. It didn't matter, you know, <laughs> how many times I gave her a book, she just wouldn't read it. And then one day my brother rang me and he said, beware, because mum's read the first half. She didn't mind reading the second half where I was all good, but she wouldn't, re but she read it. So I went round to see her and I said, what did you think, mum? And she said, tears rolling down her face, she said, I thought my poor innocent little boy, my poor innocent, she didn't see me as a monster, as a vicious gangster. She just saw her as a little boy that she knew who had been so hurt that he expressed that hurt in that terrible way. And I think again, that's how God's loving eyes like Our Lady. A big part of um, me being able to forgive myself is Our Lady. You know, I don't think it's any coincidence that when Jesus was dying on the cross, in all that pain and in all that hurt, that he said, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. Because sometimes, as John Vanier says, who started the last communities, that we have to go back into our past to tame the monsters of our past. And when I believe we take Mary's hand that was given to us at that crucifixion, it's she who takes us back through that crucifixion of these terrible acts we've done to the resurrection, which is the forgiveness and the mercy of Christ. Now, I had already been to confession and confessed all my sins, but it was only when I really saw myself as Mary saw me that I saw myself as God saw me. And so I think that was one of the reasons why God gave us that gift of Mary at the cross, because it was the most terrifying moment of his life. I was at a retreat and the priest was speaking about Mary's role. And he was saying that what Mary wants is to make up for our pain. And she knows our pain. But the only way she knows to make up for that pain is to lead us to Jesus. And, and he also went on to speak about a consecration that we can consecrate our hearts to Mary and through Mary to Jesus. And, and I was a bit naive at the time. Or I, and so I just knelt down at this image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and I just consecrated my heart. I consecrated everything I was to Mary and through Mary to Jesus. I just said, present me to Jesus. Like I give you everything, Mary, and I ask you to give it to Jesus. And there was a change in my life. I really, in that time, I really began to get a continuous peace. Before that, I had elements of peace, and then I'd have elements of, um, you know, feeling that um, I was, uh, well, I just wasn't at peace, you know, where I felt, you know, racked about by the world and everything else. But it was after I consecrated my heart to Mary in that simple prayer that I started to get the peace. And then I learned of this consecration, which Pope John Paul II did, which is called True Devotion to Mary, which was created through St. Louis de Montfort. And he said, when we truly consecrate our heart through Mary to Jesus, we become everything that Christ wants us to be. And I did this 33-day consecration. Now, I had never really done anything in the way of ministry. I might have prayed over a person, but I'd never really done talks. I'd never really emceed retreats. The very day I finished that consecration, a friend of mine who ran a massive organisation in England called Youth 2000, he asked me if I would MC my first retreat. And I truly thought it was like preparing through that consecration to become everything that Christ was calling me through that prepared me to be able to start ministering in the way that Jesus really wanted me to minister. So I think it was through that consecration to Mary that I really became the person that Christ wanted me to be. I went for a year of doing penances. I remember a priest at the first um, retreat I was at, he said to me, 
why don't you go to this place in Ireland called Loch Derg? And I said, well, what's Loch Derg? And he said, it's an, it's an island where you fast and you fast from sleep. And, you know, you really show a great, um, um, a great penance for your sins, you know. And I thought, what on earth do I want to go there for? I'll just be tortured for a weekend. You must be joking. But he must have seen that all the terrible things I had done, I needed to really repent. And it wasn't enough to go to confession. I need to. So when I came away not listening to him, I ended up doing penances myself. And you know, I'd walk for miles barefoot, um, cutting my feet to shreds. I'd fast for weeks on end with no sleep, very little food, almost going to the point of madness because of the terrible um, um, like sacrifices that I put on myself. And I don't think for a moment that God was asking me to make these penances, but I wasn't, you know, I was, the pride in me was making these penances and I suffered as a consequence to it. And you know, like I think that's why I had such a helter skelter ride for that first year because I had elements of peace, but I was also inflicting so much um, pain on me through dependencies that it wasn't a continuous peace. But when I went to that retreat and he spoke about consecration to Mary, I realized that God wasn't asking me for those penances. He was asking me to allow him to love me. You know, I, I had a bit of a breakdown when I went through those penances. And I remember I was in this hospital probably about four days, I was a voluntary patient, but I went into this hospital four days after I had made that consecration at that retreat. And um, this man walked over to me, beautiful man, John King, he just used to walk around with a Bible. Everyone said that he was mad, but to me, he was like an angel to me. And he sat down opposite me and he said, you think you're God? And I said, no, no, I don't think I'm God. And he said, you do, you think you're God? And I said, I don't. He said, you do, because why do you judge yourself? He said, God is the judge, and he's much more merciful to you than you are to you. I felt the Holy Spirit go right away through me. And I realized God hadn't abandoned me. I was abandoning God because I wouldn't forgive myself. And I walked up to this doctor and I said, I'm a voluntary patient, aren't I? I can do what I like. He said, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to Mass. And that was the end of any sort of... Um, me feeling disowned by God. And, and that was the peace where I started really receiving the peace. I thought, I'm never judging myself again. I say I'm sorry when I've done something, when I've committed a sin. I go to confession, but I am never judging. God's the judge, and I allow him to judge me. And as I said, uh, you know, to me, when we see ourselves through God's eyes, we're never condemned. We're always encouraged. Even though I couldn't be more sorry, for what I had done to that man. I think Jesus knew through the penances, through the prison would have meant nothing compared to what I did to myself. And again, I don't think God was asking me to do it, but he knew my heart and he knew how sorry I was. Like, you know, everything in my life was based on sin. So even coming from that re the first retreat where I knew the love of Christ for me, I had been to confession, I had had an incredible miracle with the Eucharist. Everything in my life was based on sin. So it's very difficult to me to come from that environment back to my lifestyle. And I remember I started doing um, building work. I'd never done a day's work in my life, really. Do you know what I mean? Not hard work. And I thought, well, I should, you know, and I was doing this building work. It was driving me mad, you know, like I hated it. And I thought, you know, I never feel fulfilled in it. I didn't feel happy. I actually ended up leaving the building work and doing a mother drug deal. And I sat there, like I was earning 45 pound a day doing this building work. And I made one phone call and earned, tw and earned 25,000 pounds. And I sat there with 25,000 quid on the table. And I just felt so guilty about what I had done, you know? And I ended up sticking it in an envelope and putting it through the letterbox of Oxfam. So I hope the person who came in the next morning was honest or else he just wandered off with 25 grand. But anyway, and then I went to confession and I, you know, I confessed and my mum, God bless my mum. I went round to see her after this confession. I said, look, mum, I've jacked in that job of building and I don't know what to do. And she said, do some voluntary work. She said, give, do some voluntary work. 
She said, that will fulfill your heart. Well, <laughs> it was like God speaking, because I started doing work with the disabled, taking them to, you know, I was driving a minibus, I was driving um, blind people to their club, I was cooking for the elderly, I was in the St Vincent de Paul, I was working in the youth club, I was working 16 hours a day. And I had never had so much joy in my heart. And, and to me, it was that that I think really led me to that peace because I started really giving and giving until it hurts, you know. And I think at first it was payback. It wasn't a freedom in giving. I, I actually thought that you had to pay back God for his generosity in saving you and, you know, dying for you. But then I realised that it wasn't that I had to pay back. It was that I wanted to pay back because his love was so much in my heart that to respond to that love was a gift. It wasn't, you know, you didn't have to do it. And so it became a freedom in giving, which was even more blessed. Obviously, when I wanted to leave, I went to a guy who was a bit like a father to me. Um, his name's Bulldog in the book. And uh, he was like a massive East End villain. And I said to him, look, I found God and I want out. And we used to call him Buller. And I said, I just want out, Buller. I don't want this anymore. And he said to me, I give you my protection, which really meant that I could leave and no one was there to touch me. And that's the only way I could leave, because otherwise I would have been taken out. I, you know, I knew too much. It was too, you know, what we was doing was too, um, there was too much at stake. But because he gave me his protection, it, maybe that was his um, insurance with God. That if there was a God, well, at least I let your, uh, <laughs> the guy who found you go, you know. And Bullo, he started praying towards the end of his life, thank God, you know, through my witness and through me visiting him. So, and he had a bit of a change, so. I was going to ask you about that. So, he, he's not alive anymore? No, he died of brain cancer, but um, towards the end of his life, he was praying the divine mercy. So, it was a, a quite a massive change in his life. He gave up um, the crime to look after his wife, who had had a stroke. And during that time, he, he really found, a, um, a, I think, a depth of God and for his uh, love. I set up this group about nine years ago and um, it, it started off as a mission team and we was going around the island doing missions, doing retreats and then it sort of evolved into being a proper community and we called it St Patrick's Community. Now when we first started we made one year commitments and the three promises we made in that one year was we were celibate, we wouldn't have girlfriends and for the girls who are in the community because it's a mixed community they wouldn't have boyfriends. So we could be pu purely um, focused on the work and we wouldn't have any distractions. And uh, the second commitment we made is we lived off God's providence. So we never charged for anything we did and we couldn't receive payment for what we did. So in other words, if people want to give us a donation, they can, but we don't charge. And it's our safety net, because if we're living off God's providence and we're doing what he wants, then he gives us everything we need. If we're living off God's providence and we're not doing what he wants, then he doesn't give us what we need and we all go off and find what it is. So it's our safety net. And the f third one is that we're obedient to the teachings of the church and to our servants, the people who are in charge of us. And because we were under the bishop now, that's, who we're in, that's who's in charge of us. So we're obedient to our bishop. He more or less knows that we know what we're doing it isn't like we're seeing him every week, but every six months we will have a meeting with him. He'd go, he wants to know what we're doing for the next six months and he'd go through it with us. He'd say, well, maybe you need a bit more time in getting filled up yourselves. You know, he's just, a, and so being obedient to him, it's like to us, our father, you know? And um, so they're the three promises. As the community evolved, we've now made five-year commitments. So everyone in the community at the moment has made five-year commitments. 
and maybe some of us feel we might be called to this for the rest of our lives. You know, and we all wear wedding rings as part of that sort of that we're married to Christ. So at the moment, I think I've got about three and a half years to go with the five-year commitment that I make. So it was um, nine of us at the original. Originally, people have come and gone because it was a year commitment. But a year and a half ago, I think there was about eight people in community then. But because we wanted to make five-year commitments, some of the people didn't feel they could make five-year commitments. And, you know, that's fine. And if people come, for the first two years, they could only make one-year commitments anyway. But at the moment, to be honest, with what we're doing, the work we're doing, it's probably the perfect number. We would need another five, because we, then we could have two mission teams going. But five is probably a good number for the mission team, the, the missions we're doing. So God knows what we need. One um, guy, Neil, he was um, a football, he was into football violence in England. And he had, um, he was brought up as a Catholic, left the church, became quite involved in football violence, drugs, drink, and then came back with an amazing conversion through um, confession and through the sacraments. Um, Breeder, she's never been far away from the church. She was bullied as a kid, which added to a bit of her pain, but she's never been too far away. She's always been close to God. So when she speaks, you know, it's a different group of people who she's um, reaching and ministering to. Catherine, she was a nurse by profession. She was very badly um, um, criticised as a child. And so that added to her pain, you know. But again, she's never been too wayward, never been too crazy. But, but she, and she would minister. A bit of her problem was relationships. And it wasn't that she was incredibly promiscuous, but she would have been hurt in a few relationships, which the world says are fine, but she found really wrecked her heart, you know. And then Matthew was a barman and, uh, you know, drinking too much, drugs, and um, he found a real revelation at one of our missions, actually. He came to one of our missions had a big conversion. He was from America and he wanted to come back to Ireland to join us. So after being reconciled with his family, he came back and he's been with us about four years now. So it's a mixture really. They're not all gangsters. After World Youth Day, a friend who's in community, Neil, he prayed over me and he had a picture of me going around the world lighting fires um, in all these different countries. And the words he got was, um, I will set my world ablaze with the Holy Spirit. And then all these invitations started piling in for me to go to different countries. So we discerned as a community that it was right for me to go to these different engagements. So in the last um, year, well, in the last eight months, I would have been to well over 20 different countries. And, and to me, that's part of the grace of being open to what God's calling. And why that's happened, that they've still been doing a lot of parish missions. And so the beauty is that now they're having to use more gifts. Because whereas before I was doing a lot of the talks, they've had to step in and do talks. They've had to take on more responsibility. And I think again, it's the Holy Spirit developing gifts and qualifying them in what he's called them to. And so it's very beautiful. But like I say, when I do go back, I'm just one of the community and we're living and we're praying together. So it's been a real blessing from God, me traveling and the community still carrying on, you know. We do a parish mission. We go into a parish and the weekend we'd speak at the masses. And then on the Monday, we would go in all the primary schools around the area and we'd invite all the kids to come to the parish mission. And we'd offer them a little present if they came. And the present is a rosary um, a miraculous medal and a, a rosary card. And it's amazing how many of these kids come. And of course, they bring their parents with them. And now many of these parents aren't going to mass, but because they feel so welcome to the mission, they come to the mission for each night and then they end up coming back to the church. The other thing we do is on the Monday night, we would really speak about the power and the grace of the love of God for us. On the Tuesday night, it would be God's mercy. On the Wednesday night, we'd have a healing service where Jesus in the Eucharist comes to each person. On the Thursday night, it would be the grace of Mary. And on the Friday night, it would be 
uh, Mass to the Holy Spirit. And, and during the week we also go in all the secondary schools and we invite the young people to come to the missions. And so what we find is that we go to the areas where maybe people aren't coming to Mass and we invite them to the mission and then they come back as part of the church. A big grace in our missions is that a lot of people come back to the sacrament of confession. So, you know, in one um, cathedral, um, <coughs> Letterkenny Cathedral, we had 26 priests and a bishop hearing confessions for over two hours. And they said the average confession was between 20 and 40 years. So you can imagine how many people are coming back. Too many people worry about what's the follow-up. You know, we're talking about the creator of the universe here. So if he wants follow-up, he'll give follow-up. Mother Teresa was asked once, why is it that you, you know, do what you do? It's like a drip of water in a bucket compared to the suffering around the world. And she said, yes, but if everyone put their drip of water in that bucket, the bucket would be full. So to me, if I'm doing what God's asking me to do, well, maybe there should be someone coming in after us doing the follow-up. But then, to me, when someone goes to confession after 40 years, and he's crying his eyes out, or she's crying her eyes out, they're changed. You know, the follow-up is Christ, and whatever they need, he's there to give them. But they're changed, and that's what we do as a community. And so I think this follow-up business, like, you know, I said, we had a, a youth retreat, and there was about, I don't know, 100 youth here. And this guy said to me, he said, we need to do a, um, uh, what do they call it? You know, where you do a questionnaire at the end to see whether the kids liked it. And I said, well, I can tell you now, the ones who opened their heart to God, did they put on the questionnaire? It was fantastic. The ones who didn't open their heart to God, did they put on the questionnaire? It was useless. Why do we need a questionnaire? It's obvious. Like to me, when I think I've done a good talk, it's normally useless. When I think I've done a bad talk, it's normally brilliant. So who am I to evaluate? And I've been doing this for 15 years. So I, I just think it's comical almost to, to have that idea that we can evaluate God. You know, I was saying today, um, in the talk I was giving, a priest was saying to me he felt very disheartened because he had started a youth programme and no one had responded to his youth programme. I said to him, well, when we was praying outside an abortion clinic in the Bronx, we never had a save. Even though we had women counselling, um, the women who were going in, no one chose to save their baby. Then we got a talk by this nun, she's called Sister Dorothea. She was working about 10 miles away in another abortion clinic in New Jersey. She said she had hundreds of saves. And she said our prayers and our witness was going towards her, the Holy Spirit bringing those women to her to keep their babies. And I said that to that priest, maybe a parish down the road has just had mass conversions because God never ever asks for success. He only ever asks for faithfulness. And if we're faithful to what he's asking us to do, then he will bless it. And we don't need to see the success. He sees the success. That's his affair. All we have to do is turn up and do our best. You know, I was walking around to a school and there was 200 boys at this school and it was a rough school. And Neil, who was in community with me, he said, he was obviously a bit nervous because there's 200 boys and they're all rough, you know. And he said, what do you think the days they'll be like? And I said, well, it's either they'll be the greatest miracle on earth or it's they'll be the biggest disaster on earth. But if it's the greatest miracle on earth, it's God's miracle. If it's the greatest disaster on earth, it's God's disaster. Because all I'm doing is turning up and doing my best. And it's not my control, it's God who's in control. And the more we let go and we let God, the more I see the miracles happen. And Neil said it truly changed his life, that statement. Because after that, he knew it didn't depend on him, it depended on God. And that's our freedom, isn't it? You know, we can just do our best. If it's a complete and utter misery, <laughs> and you know, sometimes it has been. I've gone in schools and it's pandemonium. And I say, well, God, I'm just here. You want to create miracles, you do it. But I'm just doing my best. I mean, other times you see the kids crying their eyes out. You know, the Holy Spirit descends and they're opening their hearts. They're walking up the front and giving themselves to Christ. But it's his glory, it's not mine. 
and it's his failure, it's not mine. You know what I mean? I don't think God fails, I think God just does what he likes. St. John Bosco said, the more a kid screams at us, the more he's saying, please love me. And I think for me, that um, I've worked with a lot of very broken kids. Like one boy I worked with, Stuart, he had suffered every bit of abuse it was possible to suffer. And I remember saying to him um, on one occasion, he had a big conversion and sort of found uh, Christ. And um, I remember saying to him on one occasion, um, the Holy Spirit really is telling me that you've been badly sexually abused. And he just said to me, no one knows that. I mean, no one, how can you know that? And I just said, he's saying I pick up Stuart. He was 16, he was with us in the, uh, you know, community. And I just said, I really see, I can really see that, you know? And, um, and I really felt that God was asking me to pray over Stuart and to ask, the same as Lily, to ask for Christ to come into those areas where he had been abused. And, and through that, you see the transformation in this kid. He was so healed and so changed in his heart. And I just thought, that's the beauty of Christ, you know. He reveals it only to bring healing. And I would say a lot of the anger in Stuart and a lot of that deadness was healed through that light of Christ. And what I find is the more a kid opens their heart um, to Christ, the less anger, the less pain, but it's normally only because they've been hurt. In my own life, I was so, um, the shutters were up, I wouldn't let anyone in because I was so hurt as a kid. So I think I understand it quite well because I was it, you know. When I started the community, um, I had to get some advice from people who really had set up communities before. One of the people I spoke to was Father Bernard Murphy, who's now in charge of the Franciscans of the Renault in the Bronx and um, New York. And I asked him about community, and having led a community before he even took over f as leader as the Franciscans, he said to me, make sure your charism is right. Make sure that you clearly identify what your charism is, and then keep that charism. Now our charism is evangelization. We never change, we never alter, it's evangelization. But to evangelize, you can't evangelize without the source, you know, which is Christ. And so we have a very strict prayer schedule when we're in community. And now I had stayed in a lot of different communities around the world, and personally, and I seem to try and take the best out of those communities and build up a prayer schedule. So we would pray from the office, as the church does, you know, every day, that we would pray morning, evening, and night prayer. We would also go to mass every day. We would do an hour's adoration each day. So that's an hour sitting before the Blessed Sacrament. We would pray divine mercy, and we would pray that, <laughs> chip, chip, chip. we would pray that three o'clock in the day, but also three o'clock in the morning. So we would all get up as a community and we would pray at three o'clock in the morning. And the reason for that is we believe that if we want miracles, we have to sacrifice. And so the more we sacrifice, and getting up at three o'clock in the morning is a sacrifice, especially when you're doing a mission, because we do it all the time. So whether we're on mission or whether we're back at the house, we get up at three o'clock. We also pray the rosary each day. As which is an important part. So as you can see, it probably works out about two and a half hours of prayer a day, three hours of prayer a day. And we believe that with that foundation, we can do the work that God's asking us to do. One thing that we do, which I haven't seen in any other community, is at night prayer, we would do an open examination of conscience with each other. So we would apologize to each other for what we've done wrong during the day. And we find that's where we can love each other the most, by being so open and so real. We also make the commitment that we will go to confession once a week. So we get rid of all our sins in confession, but we also um, have an examination of conscience open to each other every night. Night prayer can take an hour sometimes. So like, you know, it depends on <laughs> how, how the day's been. We also thank God 
for the blessings we've received or where we've been open to God, but we ask his pardon for the times where we failed the Holy Spirit and haven't been open. So, you know, if, for instance, if Breda upsets me during the day, and she might not say anything at the time, but at night prayer she says, look, John, I'm really sorry for not making you a cup of tea because I was angry at you. It's amazing how much, because I think she hasn't even noticed, but she has noticed, and vice versa. If I've lost my temper with Catherine and just got a bit, like, sharp with her, at night prayer I say, I'm very sorry, Catherine, for, you know, getting sharp with you and not loving you the way I should. So it's that sort of... And also, if I feel, you know, for instance, um, I'm down in the high street and it's summer and there's a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of girls who have got hardly anything on, and I feel very lustful, I will say I was lustful and I ask you to excuse, because it's hurting them as much as it's hurting me, because we're all the body of Christ. And it's humility. And I think through humility, you learn to love so much more. And I think that um, personally, the more humble we are with how broken we are, the more God can use us powerfully. And the more we sort of put on this veneer of holiness and look holy to everyone else, the less God can use us, because it's a sham, it's, it's not real, you know. So I quite like being broken. It's, it's like, to me, that's my safeguard that God uses his broken person. He says it to Paul, you know, the more weak you are, you know, in your weakness, my strength's made perfect. And I think as we, as we are who we are, and we don't pretend, the more God can use us. So for the last 17 years, I've had spiritual direction. And everyone in community has got their own spiritual director. And I think it's absolutely crucial for us people who are trying to minister to God to have spiritual direction from someone like a priest or someone who is someone to, responsible and someone very um, close to God and has lived that sort of walk with God so that they can share that walk with us. So I really emphasise that we should all have spiritual direction of some form. This last priest has been my spiritual director for probably about five years. But see, because I travel a lot, I tend to have a few scattered about. And so there's priests I can call on in England, there's priests I can call on in America, there's priests I can call on in Ireland. But I have one main spiritual director as well, Father Jim Finn, who's a powerhouse. Do you know what I mean? He's helped me so much. So. I try to live it as fully as I can. Now obviously, because I'm at the disposal of the people who invite me over, it's very difficult to get a holy hour every day. But I try and spend an hour in prayer every day. It's very difficult. Sometimes you can't even get to Mass every day. But I say to the people who are inviting me, one of the commitments I make is to get to Mass. I do get up at 3 o'clock in the morning because I can do that. I do obviously pray, but the commitments I make I try to make him as authentic as, I, as if I was in community. I mean, I've wrote two books and there's a third on its way, but I've never been a great reader. But when I do read, it's almost like, again, there's something in it. God is really asking me to read because I don't read very often. But see, we do the office every day, which is the scriptures. I would also read the Bible. So even though I'm not reading, you know, maybe many spiritual books, um, but I also love films. Well, I think God, for me personally, God speaks far more for a film to me, a good film. Some of my spiritual reading can come through a film. I can feel so touched and so close to God for a film. Also, one of the things I love is God is so generous and he gave us as a community a boat. And sometimes I'm able to go out on the boat on my own and I just sit there and I pray and I'm just in the zone of God. And to me, there's more spiritual grace in that for me than anywhere else on the earth, because I just feel so close to God and nature and the wonder of God. Sometimes prayer to me is like torture. Sometimes I feel like I'm being wrapped up in barbed wire in prayer. But I'll give you an example. I was in Cincinnati. And I wanted to go to the IHOP, which is the International Pancake House. As you can see, I like pancakes. And um, 
I, and I, you know, I just felt, well, you know, I, I'm, I should really do a bit of prayer. So I went into this chapel, I was staying with some Dominicans, and I went into their chapel, and I was doing the office, and he was like pulling teeth. And I just thought, what am I doing here? And I just turned to Jesus and I said, what on earth am I doing here? I said, I could be in the IHOP eating pancakes, but I give up my time to come to you, and all I do is get tortured, so why am I here? And I felt him say, what about yesterday? And yesterday I had been lustful, I had been selfish, I had been spiteful to one of the people I was with, and it was like him saying, you need to go through your examination of conscience. It's not me who's putting up the barriers. I'm loving you exactly the same every day. It's you who's putting up the barriers for your sin. And as I went through this examination of conscience the day before, and I apologised to God for being so lustful, for being so selfish, for being so prideful, for being so spiteful, the barriers came down and the grace came pouring in. And I felt loved. But God hadn't stopped loving me. I had stopped loving God. And the barriers were up because of me. And I think a lot of times when we are in barbed wire, it's because God is saying something to us and we don't want to listen. And so we can sit there all holy, but really we're not in the presence of God because we're not surrendering to God. So, and whenever I go into prayer, normally if it's agitating or if it's hard, it's because I need to sit there and work out why it's agitating and why it's hard. Because there's something in my life I'm not surrendering. There's some aspect of my life that I'm not addressing. That's normally why there's a discomfort. I'm not at peace. And so because I'm not at peace, God's love isn't able to penetrate my heart. Another aspect to that is, on the other side, is I don't go in the church expecting to feel God's love. You know, I've got a friend who's been in clothes for 67 years. Her name's Mother Gabriel. She's a poor Claire. She's like my mobile spiritual director because every time I ring, I know she's always in because she's never out. And, and so when I ring her up, you know, I always get her. But one time I was visiting her and she said, John, she said, here are feelings. Feelings take us anywhere. You know what I mean? But here is faith. Faith only ever takes us to God. She said, get past the feelings and to the faith. So I don't have to feel God. You know, I think when we first find God, he gives us lots of sweeties and it's lovely. But then he says, do you love me enough without the sweeties? And I think that's where a lot of people fall away. But to me, I find that I don't need to feel God every day. I don't, you know, I can go months without feeling God, but when I most need it, he always seems to give it to me. And sometimes when I don't need it, but he's so generous that he gives me that explosion of his grace in my heart. And so I think that as much as when we might feel that prayer is hard and we might need to face something, sometimes prayer can be dry. And that's because we're, we're not working on feelings, we're working on faith. I know I have to pray every day. If I'm not praying every day, I'm not there to have peace and I'm not there to have God. Simple. Sometimes I just sit in silence. Sometimes to get in that zone where I feel that I'm quiet in my spirit, I might need to pray a rosary. Sometimes I might need to just um, repeat the name of Jesus. Do you know what I mean? In my heart. But I just think to get in that stillness. Sometimes I pray in tongues. You know, I think us as a community, I forgot to say that earlier, but us as a community, we would have all been baptised in the Spirit. We would all pray in tongues. And we would pray in tongues at the beginning of all our prayer sessions. Because I think that puts you in tune with God. That puts you in tune with the Holy Spirit. So, that, you know, I don't think there's much benefit in us praising God with morning prayer unless we're really praising Him. And so we can, you know, we ask, you know, the Holy Spirit to come down upon us so we can really praise God for our morning prayer from the office. We really ask God to help Him, to help us to praise Him through the divine mercy we're praying or through the rosary we're praying. So I think another aspect which I think is equally important is to protect ourselves from the attacks of the devil. I believe that the devil is very real 
and the devil wants to destroy everything that God wants to create. And so therefore we pray for protection. I remember a, a quite a famous guy in Charismatic Renault in um, England. He was with a priest friend of mine and he said, do you believe in Satan? And this priest friend of mine had to think. And he said, yes, I do after a while. You know, he thought about it and he said, yes, I do. And he said, what do you do about it? And this priest didn't do anything about it. But then he started praying protection. And his whole life, his whole priesthood, everything changed. And I think an important part of realizing is that we're in a spiritual warfare. It's not, you know, there's a battle going on. And if we want to, if any battle, you need to be protected. Now, part of being protected is consecration to Our Lady. Part of being protected is receiving the Eucharist, going to confession, but also to pray specifically for protection. We would also pray for any strongholds in any people who we're coming against. You know, in other words, if we're going to a parish, we would pray for the strongholds of any people in that parish that Satan might have on them to be broken. And the reason why we do that is, the, I don't know if you've heard of Maryvale Institute, which is a big institute of Catholic doctrine in Birmingham. It's a fantastic um, teaching place. And well, the, um, the person who's in charge of that is Father Paul Watson. And he told us that he was a parish priest. And when he was a um, parish priest, his worst mass, there was, didn't matter what he did with this liturgy, was Saturday night. It was awful. There was no sort of charism, there was no grace. It was just dead. And he tried everything, nothing worked. So he prayed to the Holy Spirit and he fasted. And eventually he got this message, which he felt was from God, to pray specifically for the strongholds in these people to be broken. So he prayed for two weeks. He said that at the end of that two weeks, that was the most vibrant out of all his masses. And when I heard that story, I thought well, whenever we go into school, Whenever we go into a parish, we pray for the strongholds to be broken because the devil has a lot of strongholds. And I think in ourselves as well, we pray for protection on ourselves. Well, for instance, that first retreat I went to, there was a girl who was possessed and I saw her being exercised and the priest who was praying well free priest who was praying I saw the evil come out of her with as, as clearly as I'm seeing you so I have no doubt that evil is real I went into a school some years later and there was two girls I say girls they were young ladies 17 who were deeply involved in the occult and as we went into this school it was like walking into the hordes of hell and all this satanic stuff was on the blackboard, which they had wrote up. My friend who had just come back from Mexico where she had done a lot of this stuff with um, Satanist groups and witchcraft groups, she had rubbed off all the stuff on the blackboard and she had put rejoice for the Lion of Judah had conquered. And you just felt this wave of grace that just took over in this school. But I have no doubt, and at the end of this talk that I gave, these two girls walked up and said, why is the Catholic Church the true church? And I said, how long have you been involved in the occult? And one of them burst out crying and said, I told you it was dangerous. And they asked where they could go to be helped. And I told them about a priest I knew who would help them. But to me, I have no doubt that evil is real. I've worked in Glastonbury, which is the center of the occult in England. You know, we did a Eucharistic procession and a retreat five years on the trot. We had witches and Satanist groups actually coming out in their full regalia, cursing us in the streets as we did a Eucharistic procession. There's black mass kits openly in the window. It's not a joke, it's real. And you know, it's not something I go on about, but it is something that we need to be aware of. And people who don't believe in Satan, well, to me, they're not really serving God because if they're not see, seeing it as a battle, if they're not really seeing that there's a good and an evil taking place, well, where are they? It's in cuckoo land. Christ speaks very clearly about Satan. With no uncertain terms, he speaks very clearly about hell. So I think we're very naive when we think everyone is on a nice little journey through the daffodils and we're all ended up in this euphoria of heaven. 
It's a joke. You know, we have to, we don't obtain heaven. It's a gift from God. And we have to be open to that gift. I didn't know those two girls except by the Holy Spirit telling me who they were. They were small fry in a big organisation, which was a coven. So, but both of them, thank God, came out of that coven. And both of them, I felt it was like us reclaiming that school because they had had a massive effect on this school in Liverpool. Massive. Now, I had a problem with really understanding that Jesus was present in the Eucharist. It made no sense to me at all that this little piece of wafer was meant to be Christ. And someone said to me at this retreat, and that's why I think it's very important at retreats that we allow, we're allowed to just chat. Do you know what I mean? Because I must have said this to this guy. And he said to me, well, I had the same problem, but I just said a prayer to Christ, is this truly you? And he said, why don't you do that? So because he had put it in my heart, I had just been to confession. I didn't know why it had to be such a massive confession. So I kneel down and I just say, OK, Lord, if this is you, show me. Well, as I receive Jesus, the only way I can describe it to you is every good feeling I ever had in my life was magnified a billion times. It was like the euphoria, the wonder, the completion of Christ in my heart. And it lasted you know, a very short space of time. But in that short space of time, I knew that Jesus was truly present in the Eucharist. I knew the teachings of the church were completely and utterly true. I had no, it was like a, um, uh, uh, an infused knowledge in my heart that the one true church was the Catholic church because they had Christ and that was where he decided to dwell in the Catholic church. Does that make sense? So in other words, that, you know, out of all the churches on earth, there's only one church that has the fullness of Christ, body, blood, soul and divinity, and that was the Catholic Church. And that was the church where he decided to dwell. So I knew this was the authentic church and that every teaching in that church was the authentic teaching of Christ. I had no, no doubt, no problem. Like, it was like my whole being knew. I knew I'd be a Catholic till the day I died. I had no doubt. I've never had a doubt in the Catholic Church since that moment because no one can teach you that. I can't get it out of a book. I can't get it out of studying at Campion for a year. I can only get it from the Holy Spirit. The real infusion of the Holy Spirit only comes from God and he obviously knew what he wanted me to be. That's why I was baptised a Catholic. You know? I, I can love the good in people very easily because that's Christ, you know, um, that's God. But it's loving their brokenness, which I think is the real love. You know, I think John Vanier says that, you know, it's one thing getting married and holding hands for the first three years, but when you're sitting opposite your wife at the breakfast table and you realise that she isn't the perfect woman and that she's got warts and all, it's loving the warts where the marriage starts and her loving your walks in other words that you see the monsters in each other and you're willing to love and accept those monsters and I'll be honest with you I love each member of community immensely and the way I love them is through their brokenness through the woundedness through their childhood you know I see the traits that come out in say Neil where he was wounded and rejected as a child by his parents and so some of those traits are in his brokenness so not only can I love him, I can have compassion where he needs the compassion, but also I can challenge him where he needs the challenge. But I think it's through that humility of Neil sharing with me his brokenness that reveals the person who I can love. Whereas if we pretend, you know, if we have this like veneer of holiness, we pray in the chapel and look holy for the people, not for God, it's nothing to do with God, you know, there's a famous priest called uh, Father Ian Pettit um, who wrote a book and it was God is not angry. And one of the things he says in this book is that I could be married 
and I could say to my wife, for 30 years, I'm not greedy. And every time I see a chocolate cake there, I put over this veneer that I'm not greedy. But really inside, I'm, I want the chocolate, I am greedy. But I've pretended for 30 years. Well, the first thing you do when you turn to Christ, and you say, look, help me with my greed, Lord, is he's showing you how greedy you are and you're stuffing the cakes in you. But slowly he shows you how you don't need the cake. He isn't there to fulfill you and he heals you from the inside. And I think when we pretend, Christ can't get to that area. But when we're open and when we're open with our brokenness, Christ is in, his light comes pouring in and then we change and then we become the people who Christ is calling us to be. My mobile spiritual director, um, um, Mother Gabriel, I remember ringing her up on one occasion and I said to her that, you know what, Mother, I said, the more I get close to Christ, the more I see my utter contemptibleness and my utter unworthiness. And she said, yes. And I said, isn't it great? And she said, you've got it, you've got it. And when we see, you know, I think St. Francis said, when someone said, St. Francis, well, Francis, you're disgusting, you're horrible, you're so selfish, you're so broken. And he said, you don't know the half. I'm twice as bad as what you describe. And it's almost like when we see our nothingness, we see that there's nothing that God can't do with us. And I just really believe that as we get to know that we don't have to be perfect, we don't have to be so wonderful on the outside, we just have to invite God into every part of our hearts that's the freedom that he created us for. And the other thing is that God never ever calls the qualified. He always qualifies the chosen. So people you know, who might be listening to this tape might think, what have I got to offer? And it's not what you've got to offer, it's the authority that's in your heart that you've got to offer, which is Christ. And there's nothing he can't do if we're willing to give him permission. So that's why I uh, wanted to share. And heard. 
So don't you fear to show them all the love I have for you. I'll be with you everywhere in everything you do. No matter what may happen, child, I'll never let go.